All right, guys, let's get into it. We're talking about one of the most intense moments in all of biblical history, the fall of Lucifer. Now, I know a lot of you have probably heard the basic story, but trust me, this version isn't your Sunday school lesson. Lucifer, also known as the Morning Star, is this incredibly powerful angel. We're not talking some run-of-the-mill angel, Lucifer was the guy. He had it all, beauty, wisdom, power. Ezekiel even calls him the seal of perfection. He wasn't just a background character in heaven, no, Lucifer was a big deal, some even say he was second only to God. But that's where things take a turn. Lucifer gets a little too comfortable in his role, starts thinking, why should God be in charge? I've got the brains, the beauty, the power, why not me? And that's when he gets the idea that changes everything. He decides, I'm not going to serve, I'm going to rule. Lucifer wasn't content being second in command, he wanted the throne. Isaiah 14 verse 14 spells it out, Lucifer says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will make myself like the Most High. Now, let's pause for a second. The sheer audacity of that statement. Think about it, he's in heaven, literally in the presence of the creator of everything, and he's like, you know what? I can take this guy. That's not just pride, that's delusion. Lucifer starts rallying other angels, and this is where it gets wild. Revelation tells us that he convinces a third of the angels to side with him in this cosmic rebellion. A third? That's no small number. How did he do it? How do you get literal angels, beings who have seen the face of God, to betray him? That's the real trick here. Lucifer wasn't just powerful, he was persuasive. He knew how to twist the truth, how to manipulate. He probably told them something like, hey, we're being held back. We could be so much more if we break free from God's rule. And they bought it. That's how smooth Lucifer was. But here's where things really heat up. Revelation 12 verses 7 to 9 gives us the showdown. There's a war in heaven. Lucifer and his rebel angels are squaring off against Michael and the loyal angels. This isn't just a battle of wills, folks, this is an all-out, knock-down, drag-out war. Lucifer loses. Big time. Michael, being the absolute powerhouse that he is, leads the charge and throws Lucifer and his followers out of heaven. And I mean, they don't just get a slap on the wrist, they are cast down. Exiled. Banished. Now, let's talk about the fall itself. Lucifer, this once radiant being, this angel who used to stand in the presence of God, gets hurled down to earth, and his entire nature changes. He's not the morning star anymore. He's not beautiful or radiant. He becomes Satan, the adversary. That's right, Satan didn't exist before this. It's Lucifer's fall that creates Satan, the devil, the one who would go on to tempt humanity and try to wreck everything God created. All right, let's keep rolling with this. Lucifer wasn't just some angel who got too big for his wings, he was the most powerful, most radiant, most respected being in heaven. I mean, Ezekiel calls him the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. Think about that for a second, full of wisdom. That's saying a lot. This wasn't just an angel who did what he was told. He was brilliant. He understood the workings of the cosmos, he knew God's design for the universe inside and out. And that beauty? It wasn't just about appearances. Lucifer's beauty symbolized his closeness to God, his purity, his high status among the heavenly hosts. He was even described as a cherub, which, in biblical terms, wasn't just a cute baby with wings. Cherubs were powerful beings who were guardians of God's throne itself. Lucifer had access to God in a way that no other angel did. He wasn't just in the room, he was at the front, close to the center of it all. Here's where it gets interesting. Some interpretations even suggest that Lucifer had a special role in heaven. He might have been in charge of the music, leading the praise of all creation. He could have been responsible for orchestrating the very worship that echoed throughout heaven. That's huge! It shows just how trusted, how vital he was to the whole operation up there. 
but, like with any great story, it's that closeness, that power, that status, which becomes the source of the problem. See, Lucifer didn't start out wanting to overthrow God. That kind of ambition doesn't just pop up out of nowhere. It starts small, right? Maybe at first, Lucifer simply noticed how much authority he had, how much influence he carried, and thought, hey, I'm pretty important around here. It's that slow, creeping sense of self-importance. He's looking at his position, his beauty, his wisdom, and somewhere along the line, he starts to think that maybe, just maybe, he's been underutilized. Maybe he could do things differently, better even. And that's where pride slips in. It's not just the blatant arrogance of I should be God, but the quieter thought of why should I always be second? I'm capable of more. That's the real danger of Lucifer's pride. He wasn't content being near the throne, he wanted to be on it. Ezekiel 28 verse 17 says, Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So, it wasn't just that he wanted power for power's sake. His pride grew out of his own brilliance, his own beauty. He looked at himself and thought, I deserve more. And that's where it all spirals out of control. Lucifer had everything. He was the top angel, the most beautiful, the most wise, and yet, none of it was enough. That's the root of the problem. It's not just about wanting more power, it's about wanting what was never meant to be his. He wasn't created to rule heaven, he was created to serve within it. But that wasn't good enough for him. Alright, now that we've got a clear picture of who Lucifer was before his fall, it's time to focus on what really kicked things into motion, the conspiracy. Because let's be honest, Lucifer didn't just wake up one day, stroll into heaven's boardroom, and start throwing punches. No, this rebellion was planned. It was strategic. And Lucifer was smart, he knew that he couldn't take on God alone. He needed backup. Now, how do you go about convincing a third of heaven's angels to join you in a full-on rebellion against the very creator of the universe? I mean, these angels are in the presence of God. They've seen his power firsthand. They know what he's capable of. And yet, Lucifer manages to sway them. That's some next-level manipulation right there. Here's the thing, Lucifer wasn't just using brute force or empty promises. He was playing on their desires, their doubts, their insecurities. He's offering them something more. It's the same trick he pulls later in the Garden of Eden with Eve, you could be like God. That's the bait. He's whispering in their ears, telling them that they've been held back, that they could achieve more if they break free from God's control. He's planting the idea that they deserve something better, something beyond just serving. And, let's be real, some of these angels must have been dazzled by Lucifer's status. This is the morning star talking to them, the most beautiful and wise angel in heaven. If he's saying something, it's got to carry weight, right? That's how he gets in their heads. He's using his reputation, his beauty, and his charm to manipulate them, to make them question everything they thought they knew about God's order. But here's what's really wild, this wasn't just a rebellion against God's power. This was a rebellion against his design. Lucifer is essentially saying, this whole setup is wrong. We don't need to follow God's plan, we can create our own. It's a rejection of the divine order itself. And that's what makes it so dangerous. He's not just challenging God's authority, he's challenging the very foundation of the universe. Now, let's connect this back to what we've already discussed. Lucifer's pride had been building for a long time. He's gone from being the most trusted, the most powerful, to believing that he should be the one in control. And now, he's spreading that same ambition to others. This is where the real damage starts to happen. It's not just about Lucifer anymore, it's about the angels he's pulling down with him. And remember, these angels aren't just bystanders. They're powerful beings in their own right. These are warriors, messengers, protectors. They've seen things we can't even begin to comprehend. But Lucifer is so persuasive, so charismatic, that he convinces them to throw all of that away. He's got them believing that they can take on God himself and win. It's almost unbelievable, right? 
But that's what pride and ambition do. They blind you. They make you think that you're invincible, that you can defy the very laws of existence and come out on top. When that war in heaven was over, everything changed. Lucifer wasn't just defeated, he was transformed. This is where the morning star, this beautiful, radiant angel, becomes something else entirely, Satan, the adversary. The rebellion fails. Lucifer and his angels go up against Michael and the forces of heaven, and they get absolutely crushed. There's no mercy here, this is a complete takedown. Revelation 12 verses 7 to 9 tells us that after the battle, Lucifer and his crew are thrown out of heaven, cast down to the earth. They're not just stripped of their titles or power, they're banished, exiled. It's the ultimate fall from grace. But here's where things get interesting. Lucifer doesn't just stay Lucifer after the fall. His very nature is corrupted. The beauty, the wisdom, the light that defined him, all of that is twisted into something dark. He becomes Satan. And that's not just a name, it's a role. Satan means adversary, and that's exactly what he becomes, an enemy, a force of opposition against everything God stands for. Now, we need to get something straight, Satan isn't just some cartoonish villain twirling his mustache. This is a being who once stood at the top of creation, and now his entire existence is defined by revenge. It's not just about power anymore, it's about destruction. He's been stripped of his former glory, and he hates it. He hates what he's become, and more than that, he hates what he's lost. That's what fuels his rage. But it's not just about Lucifer's transformation. The angels that followed him, they're transformed too. They're no longer the radiant beings they once were, they're now demons. And just like Lucifer, their role changes. They go from being messengers and warriors of light to agents of chaos and darkness. These aren't just fallen angels, they're soldiers in Satan's war against God and humanity. And what's crazy is that even after the fall, Satan still retains some of his original abilities. He's a master of deception. In 2 Corinthians 11 verse 14, it says that Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Think about that. Even in his corrupted state, he can still appear beautiful, still trick people into thinking he's something he's not. That's the real danger here. Lucifer's transformation didn't rob him of his intelligence or his charm. If anything, it made him more dangerous because now he's driven by a burning desire to tear down everything God built. Now, let's connect the dots from earlier. Remember how Lucifer's pride led to his rebellion? Well, after the fall, that pride turns into pure vengeance. Lucifer didn't just lose the war, he lost his place in the universe. And he's bitter about it. He's not interested in redemption or making things right. He wants to destroy. And who does he target first? Humanity. You see, Satan can't go back to heaven. He knows that. But what he can do is go after the one thing God loves most, us. That's his revenge. If he can't rule heaven, he's going to try to rule earth. That's why the Bible calls him the God of this world, 2 Corinthians for verse 4. He sets his sights on corrupting everything God has made, starting with humans. Lucifer has transformed into Satan, the adversary, and has been cast down to earth. What's his next move? This is where the story shifts from the cosmic to the human level. We're heading straight into one of the most infamous moments in religious history, Lucifer's role in the Garden of Eden. So, let's set this up. God creates humans, Adam and Eve, in his own image, places them in the garden, and everything is perfect. It's literally paradise. Adam and Eve have everything they need, no suffering, no pain, and most importantly, no knowledge of sin. God gives them just one rule, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Genesis 2 verses 16 to 17. That's it. Just one thing they can't do. Now, this is where Satan comes in. He's been exiled, he's burning with rage, and he knows he can't touch heaven anymore. But Earth? That's a different story. Satan looks at Adam and Eve, God's new, 
beloved creations, and thinks, if I can't have heaven, I'll corrupt his new kingdom. This is his opportunity for revenge. And here's the thing, Satan doesn't just waltz into the garden and start wrecking things. No, he's much more subtle than that. He takes on the form of a serpent, arguably the most cunning and deceptive of creatures. Genesis 3 verse 1 tells us, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. That's Satan's game plan. He's not going to force Adam and Eve to disobey God, he's going to make them want to. So, he approaches Eve. And notice how he doesn't just outright lie to her. Instead, he twists the truth, just enough to make her question God's intentions. He says to her, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Genesis 3 verse 1. See what he did there? He's planting doubt. He's making Eve second guess what she knows is true. Then, when she responds, Satan goes in deeper. You will not certainly die, he tells her. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil, Genesis 3 verses 4 to 5. And there it is. The same ambition, the same pride that led to Lucifer's own fall is the exact weapon he uses against humanity. You will be like God. That's the hook. Satan is essentially saying, God's holding out on you. He doesn't want you to reach your full potential. But if you eat from this tree, you can be like him. You can have what he has. That's all it takes. Eve eats the fruit, and then Adam follows. And just like that, everything changes. Sin enters the world. The paradise that God created for them is lost. They're cast out of the garden, and from that moment on, humanity is marked by suffering, pain, and death. What's so powerful about this moment is that it shows the depth of Satan's strategy. He's not interested in brute force, he's after something much more destructive, corruption from within. He doesn't need to fight an army or bring down fire from heaven. All he has to do is plant a seed of doubt, a hint of pride, and let human nature do the rest. The story of Lucifer didn't just stop with the Bible. This narrative has inspired some of the most powerful, thought-provoking works of art, literature, and even philosophy. And one of the most influential? John Milton's Paradise Lost. If you've ever heard the phrase, it's better to reign in hell than serve in heaven, this is where it comes from. Milton takes the biblical story of Lucifer's fall and expands it, giving us a character that's more than just pure evil. He's complex, defiant, and even, at times, relatable. Now, let's not get it twisted, Lucifer's still the villain. But in Paradise Lost, Milton digs deeper into his motivations, showing us a being who struggles with his own choices, his own fall, and his new reality as Satan. Here's the deal, Milton's Lucifer doesn't see himself as the bad guy. In fact, he views himself as a freedom fighter, someone who stood up against what he thought was tyranny. And that famous quote, better to reign in hell than serve in heaven, sums up his whole mindset. Lucifer would rather rule in his own twisted version of freedom, even if it's in hell, than live under God's authority in heaven. This gives us a look into the psychology of rebellion, how pride and ambition can warp your sense of reality, making you believe that even hell is better than submission. What's really interesting is how Milton portrays Lucifer's internal struggle. He's constantly torn between his pride and the deep pain of what he's lost. There's a line where he says, which way I fly is hell, myself am hell. In other words, Lucifer knows that the real hell isn't just the physical place he's been banished to, it's him. He's trapped in his own pride, his own ambition, and that's a prison far worse than any fiery pit. Now, this version of Lucifer has resonated with a lot of people because it taps into something deeply human. Who hasn't felt that pull between doing what's right and chasing after what you want, no matter the cost? That's what makes Milton's Lucifer so powerful, he's not just a one-dimensional villain, he's a symbol of human ambition, pride, and ultimately, self-destruction. But Milton wasn't the only one to explore this. Throughout history, different cultures, philosophies, and even occult traditions have interpreted Lucifer in ways that go beyond the Bible. In some Gnostic texts, for example, Lucifer is seen not as a force of evil, but as a kind of liberator. 
These interpretations suggest that Lucifer's rebellion wasn't about destruction, but about bringing knowledge, think back to the Garden of Eden. In this view, Lucifer's act of giving humanity the ability to discern good and evil was seen as a gift, not a curse. Now, before anyone gets carried away, we are not saying this is the definitive version of Lucifer's story. But it does show just how deeply embedded this figure is in human thought and storytelling. He's more than just the devil with horns and a pitchfork, he's a symbol of rebellion, pride, and the cost of ambition. What's fascinating is how this image of Lucifer keeps showing up in modern culture. From comic books to TV shows to movies, the idea of the rebellious, charismatic anti-hero who challenges authority is everywhere. Think about characters like Magneto in the X-Men series, or even the version of Lucifer we see in shows like Lucifer. These characters all borrow something from that Miltonic image of a powerful figure who's both villain and, in a strange way, a tragic hero. It's like this, Lucifer's story didn't just stay in the pages of scripture. It evolved, adapted, and became a powerful part of human culture. And depending on how you look at it, Lucifer can be seen as either the ultimate villain or a symbol of defiance against authority, of questioning the status quo. It's a story that's constantly being reimagined and reshaped, even today. Now, why does this resonate with people? Why are we seeing this version of Lucifer pop up more and more? Part of it has to do with how our society views authority and freedom. There's a natural human desire to break free from control, to push against the limits imposed by society, by tradition, and by power structures. And in a weird way, that's what Lucifer represents. He's the ultimate rebel. He said no to the highest authority, God himself, and that act of defiance is something that resonates with anyone who's ever felt trapped or controlled. Of course, that's not to say that Lucifer is a good figure. He's still the adversary, the one who opposes, the one who corrupts. But what we're seeing in modern interpretations is a more nuanced take. He's no longer just the embodiment of evil, he's also a symbol of the human struggle for independence, for knowledge, for self-identity. In some modern philosophies and occult traditions, Lucifer is even seen as a bringer of light, a symbol of enlightenment. This flips the traditional narrative on its head, rather than being a force of darkness, Lucifer is seen as the one who brings knowledge and frees humanity from ignorance. This goes back to his role in the Garden of Eden, where his temptation of Adam and Eve opened their eyes to the knowledge of good and evil. But, and this is a big but, this interpretation is controversial for a reason. While the idea of knowledge and enlightenment sounds positive, it also comes with a cost. Lucifer's gift brought sin into the world, introduced suffering, and broke humanity's relationship with God. So, even though some might see Lucifer as a figure of freedom, it's a freedom that comes with heavy consequences. What does all of this mean? It shows us that Lucifer's story isn't static. It evolves as our culture evolves. It reflects our fears, our desires, and our struggles with power and freedom. And whether you see Lucifer as a villain, a rebel, or something in between, his story continues to speak to something deep within the human experience. So, as we wrap up this journey through the story of Lucifer, we're left with a complex, multifaceted character who defies simple explanation. He's a cautionary tale about pride, ambition, and the consequences of defying the natural order. But he's also a figure who challenges us to think about authority, freedom, and the cost of knowledge. It's a story that has lasted for millennia, and it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Thank you so much for watching this video and sticking with us all the way through. We hope this gave you a fresh perspective on a story you might have thought you already knew. If you enjoyed this, make sure to like the video, leave a comment with your thoughts, and don't forget to subscribe for more deep dives like this. And as always, God bless you all.